serve as director of studies at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies, which is here in Barry, Massachusetts, on the traditional homelands of the Nipmuc people. And before introducing Joseph Goldstein, who I suspect doesn't really need an introduction to most people on the Zoom call, I'd like to give you some sense of how the evening will unfold. First, though, let me say that if you would like to have closed captions and see text in real time of what is being spoken on the bar across the bottom of the Zoom screen, you can press the button which says live transcript. You can see there's a little CC there, which stands for closed caption. Um, also, if you would like to see Joseph or me a little bit larger than the small square that you see of everyone else, you can go to the upper right hand corner where it says view and go to speaker view instead of gallery view. Or if you just like to scroll through and see who all is here and see if any of your friends are here, you can stay in gallery view. So the first part of our evening will be a conversation in which I'll mostly be asking Joseph questions that are based on the two Dharma talks that were linked in the announcement for this evening. And in the second part of our time, Joseph is happy to take questions from anyone on the call. If you have a question at any time, please feel free to send it to me in the chat, and I'll collect them and pose them to Joseph. And I suspect there will be many more questions than Joseph will have time to answer. And in some ways, I think that's a good thing. In the Dharma world, we often think of living with a question as better than getting an answer, which may close the door to your questioning. If you're having challenges with the technology at any point, any technical difficulties, please feel free to send an email to contact at buddhistinquiry.org. And thank you to my colleagues, Cassie and Kira, for making all these logistical processes work so smoothly. So while Joseph and I are speaking, um, you'll only be able to send messages to me through the chat. So there's the email for any technical challenges. Um, however, I'd like to open up the chat for a minute or so, just so everyone can see each other's chats. And I'm inviting everyone to put into the chat where you're calling from and perhaps greet others with a wave as you scroll through the Zoom room and say hello to everybody who's there. So sweet seeing some familiar faces. Someone from Uruguay and Australia, in Mexico City. So good to have you all here, Alaska. What a wild world this is where we can all be together like this. New Zealand. Okay, thank you everyone. So I'm going to give a brief introduction to Joseph Goldstein who has been practicing and teaching Buddhist meditation for more than 50 years. And I believe I speak for many of us, many of us more broadly and probably many of us on this call, when I say that the clarity, Joseph, of your teaching, both with regard to doctrine and practice, has been so very helpful. And you deliver it all with humility and a sense of humor. Joseph has written too many books to name here, but suffice it to say that these books have been translated into numerous languages and have been supportive for beginners and advanced practitioners across the world. And also importantly, Joseph is a co-founder of the Insight Meditation Society, our neighbor here in Barry next door, 
and also a co-founder and longtime board member here at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies. Um, you, Joseph, have devoted your life to writing, teaching, training other teachers, and the building of institutions that have supported so many practitioners over the years. And I am so grateful for all that you've given in your life and so grateful to be exploring the map of wisdom with you here and the territory as well as the map. Okay, so I hand it over to you. Thanks, William. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be with everyone. And as William says, the technology is, continues to amaze me. You know, that people can join from all over the world. It's really quite remarkable. Uh, so I thought we'd just begin this evening with a very short sitting, a few minutes, um, as a way of just landing and settling, getting centered. Uh, so if you just take a, a reasonably <coughs> comfortable uh, meditative posture, um, you might, if you're used to closing your eyes when you're sitting, you can close your eyes. It's also possible to sit with the eyes open if you're accustomed to that. Begin by taking just a few deep breaths to really uh, inhabit the body. Let the breath find its own natural rhythm. <clears throat> Keep in mind that it's not a breathing exercise, it's an exercise in awareness. So simply feel the breath, each one, however it presents itself. Long or short, rough or smooth. It's simply to be aware of it as it is. Sometimes we feel the breath at a particular place in the body, like the nostrils or the rise and fall of the chest, the abdomen. Sometimes you can feel the breath throughout the whole body. It's possible to experiment and just to see where the mind settles most easily. See if you can stay alert for the arising of thoughts or images in the mind. Noticing whether you become aware of them quickly, or you get lost in them for some time and then wake up to the fact that you're thinking. Cultivate a kind of investigative mind that takes interest in what it is that's happening. As you breathe in, know you're breathing in. As you breathe out, know you're breathing out. You can keep it that simple.
That nice Tibetan bell is actually an app on the iPhone. <laughs> a little technological aid. Thank you, Joseph. So we titled this evening, The Map of Wisdom, which is the title of two Dharma talks that Joseph gave not too long ago. And Tonight, I'll just be asking questions based on those Dharma talks, and Joseph will be unpacking those talks to some degree. If you have not had the opportunity to listen to them, that's okay. Um, and if you would like to listen to them, you can find them on Dharma Seed. And also, if you go to our website, um, you can find them, a link to them. So <clears throat> at the beginning, of your first talk, Joseph, you describe how you were sitting in meditation and the Buddha's core teachings arranged themselves in a certain order. And you came to think of this arrangement of teachings as the map of wisdom. Maybe we could just start there. Like, what do you mean by the map of wisdom and why might it be helpful to a practitioner to have some sense of this map? Yes, so uh, that that name or title for the talks just came to my mind. Uh, I wouldn't think of it as uh, we might normally think of a, a map as, you know, going from one place to another in a direct line. It was more that as I was sitting, and probably many people have this experience, you know, the Buddha's... Um, there's so many different aspects of the Buddhist teachings, but what's so remarkable is the inner consistency among them all. And so as I was sitting, it just came to mind different aspects, almost like a mandala, you know, and starting with that sense of impermanence and then all the implications of what impermanence um, leads to. And as I was just reflecting and really came quite intuitively, just out of that baseline of understanding impermanence, all of these different aspects really fell into place. And I just felt like it was, it was such a natural and intuitive um, description, you know, of the unfolding of the path. Um, so it's a map in that sense, you know, that really touches on a lot of the different core teachings of the Buddha, uh, all pointing to liberation. Do you want to say a little bit about why it might be beneficial to, for us to have such a map as we engage in the path? Yeah, uh, I think it's, it's, it can be really helpful because sometimes we get so uh, narrow in our view of what the path is about, you know, and about the teaching. We get so... Uh, sometimes entangled, you know, in our own individual process. Uh, and we forget kind of this, the word that came to mind is glorious, this, this glorious expression of the Dharma with so much subtlety and so much nuance and so many levels of understanding. Uh, and so a chance to just to explore each of them in turn, but also uh, how they relate to one another. So it just becomes, as I say, this beautiful mandala of the teachings uh, that really enlarges our own understanding of what we're doing in the practice. Uh, and that's, it comes out of the practice itself as it, you know, as it did for me in that sitting, but it also comes through study, you know, and that's why the study center is so, so valuable. Uh, because it just enlarges our understanding of what the Buddha taught. Um, and it is, it's really a magnificent uh, understanding. Oh, thank you. You quote 
Suzuki Roshi, the founder of the San Francisco Zen Center, is saying that the most basic teaching of Buddhism is that everything changes, that everything is becoming otherwise. You also note that as we get older, it seems to be coming otherwise even faster. I think <laughs> you mentioned that it feels like breakfast. At some point, it might feel like breakfast comes every 15 minutes. Could you say um, what you take this to mean that everything changes and why it's so important? Yeah, well, you know, in the Buddhist teachings, there are some things which we can understand and grasp, even at first intellectually and conceptually and then experientially. Uh, but some aspects of the teachings um, seem quite obvious and common sense and intuitive, whereas other aspects of the teachings, you know, are more nuanced and more subtle and sometimes even counterintuitive like the teachings on non-self, which many people have, to, it's challenging to really understand what that's about. And so starting with impermanence is something that I think everybody can relate to. Even if we're not living by that understanding, we know it to be true, you know? And so we could go up to anybody, whether they're practitioners or, or not, go up to anybody on the street and ask them, do things change? And of course, everybody will say yes, because things are changing on every level, you know, from the microscopic to the macroscopic all the time. So it's not a hard concept to grasp. And it's not that difficult when we pay attention to begin to have some direct experiences of it. And then there are just huge implications when we really do realize and experience change on more and more subtle levels, it has huge implications for how we understand what creates suffering in our lives and how to ease that, how actually to become free. So in that way, I think that the, the starting with the teaching on impermanence is just, it's a good place to start because it's, it's like open access for almost everybody. So um, you talk about, even just now, but also in your talk about how, yes, everybody can understand the teaching of impermanence. In what particular way do you think meditation practice can open up an insight into the teaching of impermanence that may be different? from, say, an intellectual argument about everything being impermanent? Yeah, well, I think there are actually some intermediate steps as well, you know, from kind of the, <clears throat> the intellectual, conceptual understanding to di direct experiences of it that people have, but on a rather gross level. So for example, we know the weather changes and the seasons change and our bodies change. So this doesn't take, it doesn't take meditation to become aware of that, right? Mm -hmm. This just are obvious aspects of our lives. But in meditation, as we practice and develop some degree of concentration, some strength of mindfulness, we begin to see impermanence at work on more and more subtle levels. And so, for example, um, we begin to get a very clear understanding that our thoughts come and go, you know, or that the different emotions that arise in the mind are coming and going. And we can actually immerse ourselves right in that process, right in the midst, for example, of a strong emotion. If we have practiced mindfulness, instead of drowning in it or being lost in it or totally identified with it, it's actually possible to explore the energetics of the emotion. You know, what's happening in our minds and bodies energetically when there's anger or excitement or happiness or sadness? And we begin to see the dynamic nature of it. It's not some solid thing. And as we begin to see 
the changing nature even within these phenomena and we're not holding on so tightly and as we're not grasping at it so tightly it actually passes through more easily uh, and it's not it's not a pulling away from it it's not denying it's not pushing away but it's not holding on it's not being identified with it and lost in it so there just comes to be a lot more ease and interest um, yeah, I, something I've said very often in the teachings, and uh, especially with uh, situations of suffering, you know, or distress of some kind, when those situations, when they arise in my mind, really pique my interest. It's like when there's some strong something happening, it's like, whoa, okay, what is this? Can I really investigate it with interest? So that's a whole different perspective than just being the victim of whatever we happen to be feeling. You know, it really turns it around and becomes the source of wisdom. So that's what that's what meditation can really bring us into the heart of what it is that's happening. And in doing that, we see the changing, the very changing nature of it all <clears throat> may we all bring curiosity to yeah. our stress indeed. yeah um, so there's, there's, a, there's a little phrase i've been using lately uh don't waste your suffering <laughs> meaning it can be explored it's, you know we can learn a lot from it rather than it you know just weighing on us mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. While we're on the topic of suffering and distress and dukkha, um, you give an account in the first talk that moves from impermanence through the four truths. And <clears throat> you use a great metaphor that you got from one of your yogis in an interview about um, rope burn, the metaphor of rope burn. Can you say what that metaphor is and maybe a little bit yeah. <clears throat> unpack how impermanence relates to the Four Noble Truths? Yeah. Um, so it, it was a wonderful metaphor that this, uh, the student came in with. If we're holding on, grasping tightly, that which in its very nature is changing, it's like holding on tightly to a rope that's being pulled through your hand. And if it's being pulled inexorably, the tighter you hold on, you're going to get rope burn. <laughs> and the more you can, <clears throat> the more you can relax the hand and not hold on, the rope just gets pulled through easily. Well, the rope being pulled is like the flow of phenomena, the flow of experience, the impermanent flow of what's happening. If we're holding on to any experience, it's going to be the cause of rope burn, of suffering, because everything in its nature is changing. And so if we're holding on to our body being a certain way, or if we're holding on to wanting our mind states to a certain way or emotions to be a certain way, the more we hold on, the more we suffer. And this goes right to the heart of the Four Noble Truths, you know, where the Buddha talked about suffering. The cause of it is craving and clinging and grasping. Uh, and the end of it is the letting go of that clinging. And that's really what our practice is about. We, as we uh, settle in, in a, in a really uh, profound way to the flow of changes, and we can do this in our practice in, in very subtle ways where we're, we're just feeling all of the energy of the body and the sounds coming and going, thoughts and emotions, and we're really in the flow, then it becomes so clear that when the mind is relaxed and open, 
it's just empty phenomena rolling on. It's, it's a very easeful state. And yet when there's desire or grasping or clinging, so that's when we feel some stress, you know, some anxiety, some, some dukkha, some suffering. Um, th there's a wonderful image, which I haven't talked about in a long time. It was a monkey trap in Sri Lanka, very clever monkey trap. People would hollow out a coconut and with just a slit in the bottom, put in some food that the monkey liked. The monkey would slip its hand in and grasp the food and then couldn't get out because the fist was too large for the opening. And really all the monkey had to do was open its hand, slip out and be free. But it was a very rare monkey that could let go of the banana or the food or whatever it was. So we're kind of like those monkeys, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we hold on even when it's causing us suffering um, because we haven't at least completely learned, oh, all I have to do is let go, slip out and enjoy that freedom. Uh, so this is a lot of what our practice is about. Um, one phrase the Buddha used very often, it comes up very frequently in the Buddhist discourses, talks about liberation through non-clinging. It's a very simple phrase, but it really gets to the heart of it and to the heart of what we're practicing. Yeah, uh, one time I was having a discussion with Bhikkhu Inalio, who you know, as a resident monk at the study center. And we were just talking about different kinds of practice. And he, he asked me, you know, what, what kind of practice do I do? And do I do, you know, Vipassana or Theravada or Tibetan or whatever, you know, many different forms. And I said, I just practice non-clinging because that's the essence of them all. You know, so instead of getting into fights and arguments about you know, which is better or quicker or faster or whatever. No, it's just, they're all skillful means for not clinging. And that gets more uh, possible for us, the clearer we see the impermanence of phenomena. I think for a long time, when I hear the phrase liberation through non-clinging, I will think of that monkey in Sri Lanka <laughs> holding on to the banana with yeah. its hand in the coconut. Yeah. So, Joseph, you, in your response there, mentioned that when we can see things as empty phenomena, that that can support us in letting go that can um, help us relax our clinging, can help us let go of the banana when we have our hands caught in the coconut. Um, and I can imagine some people might be thinking, yes, well, there's some things that might be appropriate to let go of, but what about morality or justice or climate change or certain kind of social norms or dear people to us. Um, in your talk, you mentioned the distinction that some Buddhist traditions make between ultimate and conventional, and I'm wondering if you'd be willing to say a little bit more about this distinction and how you, how you approach what one might think of as empty phenomena in a world where there are things that really matter to us at the same time. Great. So before I get into kind of the, you know, a little discussion on the two levels of truth, the more relative and ultimate, um, I think it's helpful to realize that even with things that are of value in our lives, whether it's relationships or commitment to non-harming or whatever it may be, Attachment is something extra. <laughs> we, we, can, we can be committed to 
all of these various aspects of our lives without attachment. And so just a, a, a good example of this, which is kind of rife in the world today, um, you know, in so many, in so many different religious traditions, uh, when fundamentalism, you know, becomes strong, it's really out of that attachment to a certain set of beliefs or whatever it may be, which can often lead to intolerance. One can have tremendous reverence and respect and dedication to a set of beliefs, but it doesn't have to come out of a fundamentalist attachment to them. And then there's just much more possibility when people come together with various viewpoints and various ideas for an open discussion. And we see how increasingly rare that kind of openness to discuss differences uh, all these days. And that's, that's because of the attachment. It's not necessarily because of the thing being attached to, right? And so I just wanted to clarify that attachment never adds anything to a situation, but we often think it does. You know, it's sort of, sort of like confusing attachment and love. They're two quite different things, but they've gotten so conflated very often. Okay, so <laughs> that's a little preamble. <laughs> Uh, it's so a preamble, but it's a great point to make. Um, I think it's really important. Yeah, I, I feel so. I mean, I, I've just seen it so often, kind of in my own mind and, and in the world, you know, and with so, so much of the conflict in the world comes out of attachment to beliefs <laughs> rather than simply having the beliefs. Um, okay, so in terms of the two truths, this. I have found to be a very useful uh, framework for understanding how to move through the world. So the relative level of truth is really how our conventional understanding of things, you know, and in this conventional level, there's a self and there's others. Um, it's just the ordinary circumstances of our lives. And within that, we want to pay attention to the results of our actions. And here's where the law of karma, uh, which is such an important part of the Buddhist teachings, uh, comes into play. Because he's emphasizing again and again that our actions have consequences, depending on the quality of our mind as we engage in the action. And even though I'm in some ways trying to uh, understand karma sometimes can be very challenging for people, uh, you know, in different aspects of it. But I think it's, and increasingly, especially as I'm getting older, I think it's just something that is so important for us to understand because it gives us agency about how our lives unfold. The Buddha was very clear, there's, there's a very explicit discourse in the Middle End sayings where the Buddha just described how different actions lead to different results. You know, how generosity leads to abundance and non-harming leads to good health and a, a, lot, a, lot, of, a lot of very specific examples. It doesn't help so much. People have a problem with this very often because then in their looking back and if we're going through a challenging circumstance, oh, you know, I must have done something terrible in my, life, in my last life. Or, that's not that helpful. I think it's more helpful because there can be many causes for something to happen. But I think really exploring what the Buddha taught about wholesome and unwholesome actions leading either to happiness or suffering. I think that's a really important part of the teachings because that is a map to happiness. The Buddha is just laying out 
these are the kind of actions that lead to our well-being. And so when we get really familiar with them, it gives us agency for the creation of our lives going forward. So the more ultimate level is the understanding that there is no self, right? There, there is no one there. It's just phenomena arising and passing away. And when we're on that level, for example, we may have different kinds of thoughts. If we're in the flow of change, if we're just seeing things arising and passing without any identification with them, on that level, it does not matter what kind of thoughts we're having because it's just empty phenomena. It's a thought appearing and disappearing just like a sound can appear and disappear. So on the ultimate level, if we are truly there, and, and it's not just a concept for us, so then, we, then we're in a place of that empty phenomena rolling on, the mind is very spacious, very open. So I just want to use an example of, you know, something that might illustrate the two levels. So I'll just, okay, so I'm holding up this mug, right? And on the relative level, it's a mug. And we can describe it and have all kinds of views about it, its aesthetics, its utility, whatever. If we looked at that mug through a high power microscope, there'd be no mug. Yeah, it would be a whole other level. If we, could, if we could see the subatomic particle level of what makes the mug, that's a whole different reality uh, that is being experienced. The interesting thing is that the relative level of mug and the more ultimate level of just particles arising and passing away, it's a unity. It's the same, it's the same phenomena seen on different levels. Now they work so well together because the more we understand the more ultimate level, then we can operate on the relative level with less grasping and less clinging because we understand its basic empty nature. But on the relative level, we need to pay attention to whether something is wholesome and unwholesome. So I'll just give you a few aphorisms from different great teachers that kind of encapsulate this, this teaching. So one was from the Zen master, uh, Sung San San's name, who had established in Providence uh, Zen Center and a worldwide network of Zen centers. Uh, he said, there's no right and no wrong. So that's the ultimate level. It's just, <laughs> it's just changing phenomena, changing very rapidly. There's no right and no wrong, but right is right and wrong is wrong, right? And we have to hold both. And the great Tibetan, great Tibetan uh, master, uh, Padmasambhava, he was considered one of the greatest of the Tibetan masters. Uh, he said, though my vision, my understanding is as vast as the sky, my attention to the law of karma, of cause and effect, of results of actions, is as fine as a grain of barley flour. So this union of the two is really important because people can use the idea, oh, it's all empty, so it doesn't matter what I do. That is a huge misunderstanding. It matters immensely what we do. And yet the understanding of the emptiness allows us to navigate with much greater ease. Um, so I don't know if that was clear for you all, uh, but that topic is worth exploring, this union of the relative conventional level with the underlying wisdom of the more ultimate level.
Thank you, Joseph. What you were just talking about reminds me of something you said about the middle of your second talk about um, dependent arising, the doctrine of dependent arising, holding all these different doctrines together and certainly holding together causality and karma and the ultimate and the relative and how we might think about practice in a world that is impermanent. Can you say, um, maybe start just saying, what is dependent arising? Okay, so this teaching of the Buddha <laughs> is really kind of a core teacher and fundamental. And uh, it takes quite a bit of exploration to really understand it, you know, in depth. But most simply, and this will be a very simple, uh, which is probably a reflection of how well I understand it. Uh, it describes the links. And in the traditional version, the links in the mind from the last life, which result in rebirth in this life. So starting with ignorance, because of ignorance, we get involved in all kinds of activities, those volitional activities. And those karmic activities are the cause of rebirth. And then the links go on to describe just the whole development of uh, consciousness arising, you know, in the first moment of this life. Uh, and then the development of the mind and body and the sense spheres. And then the middle part of dependent origination is really where we can really hone in in our practice in understanding how it relates to our suffering and freedom. So it talks about the development of the body and the sense spheres, you know, the, the different sense organs and the respective objects, and how that leads to contact in the sense organ, contact with the sense object. And here's where it starts to get really very precise and very interesting in a way that we can apply. So the Buddha talked about how in every moment of contact with a sight, with a sound, with a thought, along with that contact is what he called Vedana, or translated in English, feeling tone. And that is, with every contact, we are tasting it, so to speak, as being either pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. And this just happens automatically. We can't, we can't prevent that happening. When this contact, automatically it leads to this feeling tone. And we know we go through our lives this is not mysterious. We go through our lives feeling things as being either pleasant or unpleasant, you know, or neutral through all our five physical senses and the mind. Now, this feeling tone of Vedna is crucial in the whole path of liberation. Because when we're not mindful, pleasant feeling conditions desire. And we see that in our lives, we like it, you know. How many of us can have two spoonfuls of ice cream? <laughs> I think it's rare. You know, for most of us anyway, it's quite a pleasant, it's a pleasant taste experience. And so the pleasant, oh, let me have another, another taste, another taste. This is operating through all of our senses, all kinds of experiences, pleasant, experience conditions desire when we're not mindful unpleasant conditions conditions aversion you know very few people in their lives when they're experiencing pain oh good let me experience more <laughs> usually I, no i want this to go away you know we have aversion towards it and with neutral feeling we generally space out so continuing just the links because of desire, then there's clinging, you know, and grasping, and out of that, all kinds of actions, 
karmic actions, which again lead to birth, and then birth inevitably entails aging, illness, and death. So that, that's, the, that's the links, the chain of dependent origination. The Buddha pointed out, and this is where our practice becomes profound. We can break the link. We can break this chain going from ignorance to suffering at the link between feeling and craving. If we can learn how to be mindful of pleasant feeling, in being mindful of it, we're no longer craving. We're taking interest in it. We're just noticing it. pleasant, pleasant. And it doesn't mean not experiencing it. We are experiencing the pleasant, but without grasping. And we can experience unpleasant sensations or experience without aversion. You know, and one, one of the little mantras that I've used with unpleasant experiences that come and I can watch my mind, you know, the tendency to, oh, I don't like this or I want to get rid of it. Substituting a little mantra at that point, it's okay. It's okay to feel this. It's unpleasant and it's okay to feel it. And so that just relaxes the mind in the experience of it. It doesn't drive us to aversion and then all of the actions following from that. And this is how we begin to free our mind from that conditioning of desire and attachment and clinging or aversion to a place of really greater ease and spaciousness. So we can really, if we understand, even in this very abbreviated way, this chain of dependent origination and see where we can enter into it in a way that frees us, it, it, it's profound. I mean, it really can transform our lives. Maybe our next conversation will have to be about dependent arising. Um, there's a lot okay. there. I'll, I'll, I'll study up before we have it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joseph, your two talks began with the rope burn, the pain of attachment in a world that is ever eluding our grasp, the rope pulling through. And you also end with suffering, but you end with the suffering of others and a discussion of compassion, one of the four immeasurables, one of the divine abodes, Brahma Viharas. Mm -hmm. There's some people I've heard say that really, if you want to make progress of the sort that you were just talking about, insight is what you do, and that the Brahma Viharas are a nice compliment, um, but they're not really where the action is. I, I understood you to be saying in your talk that perhaps it's better to think of compassionate responses and action to others as an embodiment of insight and kind of where insight gets traction. And I'm wondering if you would be willing to unpack that a little, say a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I, I think this is really important. Uh, <clears throat> And it really opened when I began to explore this in uh, a deeper way. And it wasn't from the very beginning of my practice because I, I wasn't getting those teachings, but it came, you know, mid practice uh, when all of a sudden the role of compassion as being embedded in the process of insight really. It just became more and more clear. And it relates to what I was saying just before about dependent origination. Because compassion arises when we're willing to come close to suffer. You know, if we're in a place of denial or apathy or indifference to suffering, whether it's our own or others, there's no opportunity for comp compassion to arise because we're. We're trying to keep the suffering at bay. You know, and that itself is a very contracted, defensive way to go through life. 
so going back to what I was just saying about through the practice of mindfulness, learning how to be okay with unpleasant experiences. So it can be unpleasant as we come close to the suffering that's there. You know, and we really are starting to feel or understand or relate to the pain of others, or the, the struggles or the difficulties and ourselves within ourselves as well. It's mindfulness which allows us to come close to it. It's, as I was saying, it's okay to feel this. Let me feel it. As we're open to the suffering, as we're willing to see it, to come close to it, that's what, that's what opens up the possibility. It opens up the wellspring of compassion. So that's one aspect, the willingness to come close to suffering that is enhanced by our practice of mindfulness. In another way, the whole path of insight through our refined, ref, continually refined perception of change, and we begin to begin to get glimpses and later profound experiences of the selfless nature of this whole process. That there's no one behind it to whom it's happening. It's like we we are this flow of changing phenomena. It's not that it's happening to someone. So the more we understand the selfless nature, what happens is we become less self-centered. You know, instead of having our whole lives revolve about this strong sense of self and what we want and you know what's important to us and just that everything self-centeredness implies through the insight practice and we begin to, in a significant way, begin to get some sense of, oh yeah, this is a selfless process. It's a process empty of self. We become less self-centered and that allows us or creates the space for us to be there and relate to the suffering that is, that is all around us, that, that's in the world. If, if we're self-obsessed, then we're not going to be very open to the challenges and difficulties and pain that other people may be going through. And so a phrase that came to me as this relationship between emptiness of self and compassion started to come together for me. The phrase that came to mind is, compassion is the activity of emptiness. Right. And so there's a union there. They're not two separate things. When we're in a more selfless place, then compassion arises quite uh, naturally. And a word that I like to use really as synonymous with compassion, but for me, um, it really helps understand the mechanism of it. Uh, I like the word responsiveness. You know, when we're not so self-absorbed, then we find our heart and minds are quite naturally responsive to the situation and circumstances around us. So, you know, there's somebody hungry, we feed them. There's some need over here and we're able to fulfill it, we fulfill it. And sometimes there may be a strong feeling of compassion associated with it, but sometimes it just becomes the nat almost like a law of nature. You know, when we're not when we're not caught up in selfing, then this responsiveness just happens more and more naturally and spontaneously. And I just find it's it's a beautiful unfolding when we start you know, proceeding along that trajectory. And so in this way, compassion and insight to me are just inextricably uh, related. Thank you, Joseph. 
I want to ask one more question before we open it up. And that is a question that um, is just me reflecting on how in your teaching, you often go to a poem at important points to, to integrate into your teaching. And also, I know you've been writing poetry and you've shared a number of your poems with me. And um, I guess I'm interested in hearing what you think the role of hearing, listening, teaching with, or writing poetry might be in relationship to being on the path. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure I have this exactly right, but I seem to recall something that Mary Oliver once said, you know, the great, really great poet. Uh, she, she was equating the poetic sensibility with paying attention. And her poems so reflect that, you know, because her attention to her experience is so exquisite. And then her use of language to describe it and so I find, I find that poetry often is a crystallization of just a very clear perception of something, you know, that's not, that's not embedded in a long dissertation. Uh, it's just, it's condensed, it's concise, and it's, it just points to something um, very specific and very clear and it illuminates it you know and so the often the poetry that i'll read you know i find is just illustrating some particular experience we have in our lives that reveals a real dharma understanding and so i'll just share one of my little poems because it illustrates this point uh, i was on retreat and I was just doing walking meditation. And I was just hearing different sounds. And then this little haiku-like poem, it just came to my mind. Bird song in the empty sky of my mind. You know, and those words just reflected the experience you know, it, it highlighted, yes, the bird song and everything else is arising as an appearance in the mind, the empty sky of the mind. And so that's just an example of how, you know, we can take a few words and a few lines and really point to some experience or other that can be uh, tremendously illuminating. Uh, so I love it. I love when the muse strikes, <laughs> I, lo I love the creative process of writing and also just reading and sharing, you know, poems that have really moved me. Okay, thank you. Why don't we move to questions that have come in? They're already a number. I've copied and pasted them onto a Word document, and I have several pages already from folks. Um, and some of these questions um, feel like they'd be great questions for one's own individual meditation teacher. And I'm going to start with questions that are a little bit more focused on um, what Joseph has been speaking about tonight. One of those is how are not selfing and responsiveness related to interdependence? Well, interdependence is, is really another word for selflessness because what it points to is that everything, including what we call ourselves, arises out of uh, arise out of particular conditions coming together. 
And if the conditions are no longer there, then the experience is not there. So just an example that I use very often is in terms of understanding interdependence and emptiness of substantial existence. You know, in the case of a human being, it's empty of self. But the example I'm going to use is that in something in nature, um, not a rainbow. You know, uh, we can we can go outside after rain. You know, conditions are right, and we see a rainbow, and it's beautiful, and we all enjoy the beauty of the rainbow. But the rainbow is not a thing in itself. The rainbow is an appearance that arises out of conditions of moisture and light and air coming together in a certain way. And these conditions come together, resulting in the appearance of a rainbow. And so we could say that, this, this may be <laughs> mixing metaphors a little bit, but uh, the rainbow is selfless in that sense. It's not a thing in itself, it's arising out of conditions and the conditions change and rainbow disappears. Well, we can apply that to this whole mind-body process. There's an interdependence. We come into existence dependent on so many conditions coming together and continuing to live through so many conditions coming together. And so there's not some core being that exists independent of those conditions. Like what we're calling self is like the rainbow, right? It's an appearance arising out of the coming together of the conditions which go into making this mind and body. Uh, and so it's just, Interdependence really is another way of saying or, or understanding what selflessness means. Thich Nhat Hanh speaks, you know, he speaks beautifully about this. I, I think he, you know, he's spoken of what goes into the food that we eat, you know, and how many conditions come together for this food to appear before us in terms of you know, the seed for the plants and the moisture and the earth and, the, and then all the people cultivating it and all the people the, transporting it. And, you know, he goes on and on. There's an enormous number of conditions which go into a very simple activity we have of eating, right? And it just shows how everything is interdependent without yeah, without a substantial self-existence. It's the, it's the appearance of things coming together in, in this interrelated way. So the two are very, very, um, you could almost say they're synonymous, emptiness and interdependence. So one question, that came in was with all this emphasis on conditioned arising and um, what later Buddhist traditions think of as interdependence that you've been discussing. Um, what about the unconditioned? Um, that which is not changing um, and um, are there practices, maybe this might be taking us too far afield, but are there practices that allow one to bring the unconditioned into the foreground or what, what might that mean? Um, yeah, if you could just say a little bit more about the unconditioned in relationship to this emphasis on dependent arising and its conditionality. Yeah, <laughs> that's getting to the heart of the matter. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it's interesting, the, the, Buddha, the Buddha talked about, and it's quite a remarkable statement, I can only paraphrase this, but he says, 
his teaching is not for the purpose of morality. It's not for the purpose of concentration. It's not for the purpose of insight. So all the things that we think we're practicing for, he's saying, we're not actually practicing for them. Those are the, that's the mechanism. We're practicing for what he called the sure heart's release, which is the experience or comes out of the experience of the condition, which in Buddhism is called Nibbana or Nirvana. Um, and different Buddhist traditions will have different interpretations of that. Uh, <laughs> William and I, we, we had a previous session like this about reflections on Nibbana. Uh, so the whole path of insight that we're on and, and the practices of morality you know, and generosity and loving kindness and insight it's the insight Vipassana practices which culminate in the experience of the unconditioned, which is that which goes beyond or transcends this conditioned process of changing phenomena, right? Uh, and it has the power, these moments of experiencing the unconditioned have the power to uproot in stages the various defilements in the mind which keep us bound to the conditioned. You know, and so at different stages, it uproots the view of self, it uproots desire and aversion, and finally uprooting all ignorance. Um, so it is very much, it is the culmination of the path. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> this could be a, a many hour Dharma topic. So I don't know if that addressed, at least in brief, the question, or, or if you think there's a follow up to that. Well, one follow up I just put into the chat a link to a page which has a link to the conversation about Nibbana, where. Um, if you would like to hear more of Joseph's thoughts, then we have time remaining. That would be a good place to start. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's just to say that very often, especially, uh, um, you know, these days and uh, the spread of, you know, what has been called secular mindfulness, which is all to the good, you know, however, for whatever, whatever domain it's used in, it, it's helpful and it's useful, but it often, as the practice and mindfulness is spreading so much, we often lose sight of really the goal the Buddha was talking about, which is liberation, you know, which is freeing our mind from ignorance and that comes about through the whole path, um, which the Buddha described as the Eightfold Noble Path, you know, with different components, but it culminates in this experience of the unconditioned. And so I think it's very good to explore that and really understand it as the highest value. Here's a question, which I think is a very important one um, from somebody who says that, yeah, they get that things are impermanent, um, and that even when there's a strong emotion by being non-reactive and allowing that emotion to pass through, um, it pass, can pass through more quickly and more easily. But what about particular patterns, this question asks, that keep arising? How do we begin to address the underlying causes? Impermanence doesn't seem to really address the arising of particular recurrent phenomena such as anxiety, anger, etc., that themselves cause suffering simply by their very arising. Um, let me see if you think this is important for the reason I think it's important. Go ahead. Yeah, well, there are two different uh, 
elements to the practice. So I, we, we were emphasizing, you know, in the discussion, the element of impermanence. But I mentioned briefly, you know, in kind of the dependent origination, in our, in our Vipassana practice, mindfulness practice, the key is not so much about venting things from arising, but about how we're relating to them. And so this goes very much to that point, how do we relate to what is unpleasant? So in this case, we're talking about unpleasant emotions. And something I've talked about a lot over the years, for me, the predominant, deeply rooted, unpleasant emotion that came up so strongly for a very long time was the emotion of fear. And just for whatever reason, that's what was conditioned, you know, in my mind and very unpleasant. And it would often come up very strongly on retreat. So I was working with it a lot. And I learned so much from it, but it took me a long time to really discover the key to the release. And it really points to the difference between recognition and mindfulness. Because I was recognizing it. I knew that it was fear. But all the time I thought I was being mindful, I wanted it to go away. You know, I had aversion to it because it was very unpleasant. It took me a long time. But at a certain point, something shifted. If this fear is here for the rest of my life, it's okay. And in that moment, that it's okay was the first moment I genuinely accepted it. I know of her, it's okay. Let me feel it. And it was amazing because in that moment of acceptance, that whole, whatever the story was, whatever the energy of it was, completely washed through. And it doesn't mean that fear never arises again, but the relationship to it has completely shifted. And the it's okay mantra really comes into play. And so then, even if it's arising, if we're not reactive to it, if it's okay, okay, it's unple it is unpleasant. It's not, it's not saying that it's going to become pleasant, but it's okay to feel something unpleasant. And we're not fighting with it or struggling with it, then it washes through more easily and it's much less problematic. So all that being said, sometimes for a deeply rooted conditioning, um, can try and do all this, but it doesn't still seem to unlock it for us in some way. And so there are different modalities and sometimes psychological investigation, you know, a therapeutic uh, understanding and really trying to explore, okay, well, what are the historical you know, conditions in our lives that may have caused it. So that can also be a very useful adjunct to the meditative practice. Uh, and so there, there are different approaches we can take, but from the meditative point of view, what I found was that the way I was relating to it was the key to freeing my heart. Thank you. So there are a few questions about the role of study. And uh, as someone has remarked, there are a lot of books behind you. And uh, there are a lot of ideas that you shared tonight. And sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes one hears that one should mostly be meditating and not get too caught up in one's intellect. And the question is, what is the role of study in books, whether the suttas or other books? What is that? What role has that played in your own life as a practitioner? And I think, in what way can it be supportive? How has it been supportive for you? Yeah, I, I, 
I find it hugely supportive, and I think it can it can have a really valuable place in our in our spiritual unfolding uh, for a variety of reasons. One, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it just expands our understanding of the Dharma. You know, we have no matter how deep our practice is and uh, it's still a very limited understanding compared to what the Buddha knew, <laughs> you know? And so through study, we just begin to open up to a lot of different dimensions that we may not have even considered or understood or knew about. For example, just what we were discussing this law of dependent origination. I would never have come up with that understanding through my own meditation practice. Uh, you know, it took a Buddha mind to really understand all of those links. But through the study of it, then we can apply the Buddha's great wisdom to our own practice, you know, and it furthers it. So study just opens up um, doorways to a much greater uh, understanding of the dharma of the teachings which we can then use in our practice so that's a very significant just you know every year i do a, a quite a long retreat and lately what i've been doing instead of reading i, I listen to the buddha's discourses on audible so it's like having the buddha give the, the dharma talk every evening you know, which is quite remarkable. And it's interesting to me because in listening, I hear things just very differently. And there are so many different things that pop out that I would not have thought of, which I had not employed in my practice, you know, but then something quite significant can open up. Uh, one other aspect of study is that um, it, ins it can inspire us, you know, and the, especially as lay people living in the world, we're living busy lives, our work, relationships, we're busy, you know, and very often, even if we have a dedicated practice, you know, sometimes we can lose maybe a little inspiration. Um, and, and reading, uh, you, you know, those, those books or, or works that really inspire us can energize our practice again. So it's, it's a tremendous support in that way. When we feel things maybe are flagging or we're just getting too immersed, you know, in our worldly lives, reading, oh yeah, this, <laughs> there's something important here that I've forgotten, you know, or put on the back burner. Uh, so again, it's a tremendous, can be a tremendous help. Okay, so there are <clears throat> two more questions I was hoping to pose, but we'll see if we get to them. One is um, maybe to put it in the terms that you use in your second talk um, and thinking of Mary Oliver, that the line that's coming to me is you don't have to be good, you don't have to walk on your knees. Um, you talk about not um, not having to be the moral saint. And there's all this talk about compassion. Somebody is, one of the questions is talking about, there can be a rope burn when we think, oh, there's something that I can do um, and suggest the phrase, can something be done? And, que and the question, can something be done as opposed to, there must be something I can do and I have to do it. And I'm wondering if you want to say a few words about um, holding that a little bit more loosely, the, the emphasis on compassion. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it's, it's something I've reflected on a lot because it's so easy to get caught by some image of how we should be or how some great saint, you know, acts in the world and we feel that we don't ever quite live up to that or, and that, I don't think it's helpful at all, you know. What has been most helpful for me is a phrase which I've talked about a lot in different uh, circumstances, 
It was the title of a book by Ram Das and Paul Gorman. And the title, I love the title of this book. It is, How Can I Help? Not that I should help or not, it's just, how can I help? And I feel that's like a, that's like a mantra of compassion. So in different situations, if that thought or notion comes to mind, you know, just, okay, in this situation, how can I help? And sometimes there is something we can do, and sometimes there isn't something we can do, but at least we're posing the question, you know, and we're, we're opening ourselves to the possibility that there might be something we could do to help. So that frees us from you know, having some idealistic notion of what we should be doing and then we're not living up to that. This is just in, in different circumstances and each one is unique, you know, and the conditions are different. It's just to hold that question. It's a very, it's a very simple one, but I find for me, it, um, it just keeps that, that uh, energy of responsiveness alive. Okay, how can I help? And if there's something that comes to mind to do, then we do it. And if there isn't, then we don't, but we stay in a place of equanimity and also a certain kind of ease and connectedness just from knowing that we considered that question, you know, that we're relating in some way and we're open in some way to whatever the difficult situation is. We're not pretending it's not there. We're not trying to avoid it. We're considering it. And then how can I help? And then we see, we see what comes out of it. So it feels to me like a very easeful and natural and beautiful way of uh, living one's life. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. There's a Tibetan tradition where after a teacher teaches a text, they start at the beginning again with the understanding that at some point, either in this life or a future life, they will complete the teaching of that text with those students. And I feel that way. There, there was one question I really wanted to ask and a number of other questions which were really wonderful. And leaving those questions out there, I have this feeling that, well, maybe in this life or another life, um, those questions will be posed to Joseph by the folks who are here. Well, let's aim for this life. Let's aim for this life. <laughs> let's aim for this life. Um, so I wanted to end by saying a few words about what we call Dana. Dana is a word in several classical Indian Buddhist languages that means something like generosity. And it is the first virtue of the bodhisattva. It's the, the person who's moving along the path to awakening begins with generosity because it's both the relinquishing of that which we're attached to and simultaneously also the immediate addressing of the needs of others. And it can happen in all kinds of things. It could be relinquishing an opinion. It could be offering a gift. It could be paying attention in a particular way and being responsive to someone. As those of you who are part of the IMS BCBS world know, it also it's etymologically related to our word donation. And it is this practice of generosity. It's the practice that Joseph has had for more than 50 years of freely offering the teachings, writing those books, starting this institution, starting IMS, basically an entire lifetime devoted to serving the Dharma and freely offering the infrastructure that allow teachers to be trained and other teachers to teach and also um, teaching himself in this really clear and humble way. I personally am deeply moved by this practice of Dana and the teachers, that, they, that there's a trust in the Sangha, a trust in all of us that 
we will support them. And especially today where there's so much pressure to monetize everything and to make ourselves all entrepreneurs, the idea that we can have an alternative to that. And if people would like to offer something, uh, practice generosity, um, we welcome it. And we welcome many other forms of generosity. At BCBS, we have volunteers who come. Um, and being res we think of being responsive in your own lives, however you do as a practice of Donna. And I'm also very grateful to the many people who offered Donna when you registered. And I'm certainly very clear that if this is a time when your generosity is better expressed elsewhere, you should feel there are many ways to express generosity. And if you would like to support Joseph and BCBS shares the Donna with Joseph, so we each get some to support the institution and to support Joseph. There is a link in the chat. Um, and thank you, Kira. And there's also a link to a survey, which asks a few questions, which is also from our perspective, an act of Don of generosity to give us a sense of um, your experience and how you heard about this program. And thank you so much for the generosity of your attention and your questions. And I'm so grateful to see you all. And maybe, Joseph, you could close our evening with a short meditation. Yeah. So again, uh, let's just settle back, relaxed, easeful posture, closing the eyes, settling into the awareness of the whole body. Just sit and know you're sitting. And within that framework of the whole body, become aware of the body breathing. Letting it find its own natural rhythm. Inclining towards relaxation. Softening the eyes, relaxing the shoulders. Simply sitting at ease, aware of the body, of the breath, of any thoughts or images or feelings that arise. Maybe settling for a few moments, the heart center, that area in the center of the chest. With a feeling of benevolence, of goodwill towards all beings. May all beings everywhere be at peace. May you all live in safety and with ease.
and maybe energy of our practice together, our discussion together, be dedicated to the welfare and the happiness and the liberation of all beings everywhere. Thank you all. It's always a pleasure to join together for these dormant discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. What a gem. Thank you. 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 Thank you.